And then about a year later, he was in counseling and the counselor's like, yeah, these things are an issue that you're talking about, but the real issue is you're gay. Where would you take your life if you knew you could not fail? I get it. As a stepmom, mom, and entrepreneur, sometimes it can feel like what everyone else expects of you versus what you dream about for yourself are on opposite ends of the spectrum. As a woman, you're taught from a very young age what society thinks you're worth based on how you look, how you behave, and how much money you're allowed to bring in. But I'm here to show you that you can be the woman who has it all and not just on the outside. I'm Brittany Lynch, and you are the queen of your castle. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the Queen of Your Castle podcast. I am your host, Brittany Lynch, coming at you with special guest, Jessica Frew. Jessica Frew is a wife, ex-wife, mom, stepmom, and a bold action taker. She has a successful podcast called Husband in Law that she records with her husband, Matt, and her ex-husband, Steve. Together, they're sharing their stories of love, marriage, coming out, divorce, remarriage, and co-parenting to help others know that they are not alone. They also co-own The Bold Logic, and The Bold Logic is a company devoted to helping people go from living in an I should mindset, aka shooting all over yourself, (laughs) <laughs> I should mindset to taking bold action toward keeping and reclaiming their sense of self. Jessica is a firm believer that by knowing and understanding what it is you really want in life, you can boldly create a life you love no matter what your circumstances. So obsessed with this, so important, so in alignment with um, our audience and what I believe in and what Step Queen believes in. And I'm so happy to have you on the show, Jessica. Thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, we've been talking about this for a hot minute. And finally, <laughs> finally, we're in the flesh and if, if in, the, in the virtual flesh, because yeah, but we did it. We did it. It feels great. Thank you for being here. Um yes. Incredible intro. We love that. But let's hear it right. Let's hear it right from your mouth. Who is Jessica Fru? What is this very fascinating, very unique, very special story that you and your step family have? Yeah. So currently my family is made up of myself, my husband. I have two stepkids who are 14 and 12. She's almost 13. That's crazy. And then I have a daughter from my first marriage. Um, and she's 11. Her name is Penny. And then my ex-husband is very much still a part of our family. Um, he comes over for holidays, birthdays, um, Sunday dinner, like anytime we can get him, he comes and hangs out by the pool and he actually works for my husband now. So my husband owns his own business and he recently hired Steve on to come work for him. So, I mean, that's kind of our family dynamic. He does not live with us. There's nothing weird going on, but (laughs) he is a very important part of our family. Mm -hmm. For someone who doesn't know you or husband-in-law, I'm going to ask you to take us way back to your first marriage. Okay. And uh, explain this really in my, from my point of view, really cool story, but I'm sure for your point of view, took a lot of healing to get to the point where you could say it's a cool story. So take us back in time. Once upon a time, girl meets boy, they fall in love. Then what? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Steve and I, I mean, that is kind of how it it happened. We met on a Friday night. We went out on Saturday night and we were together every day. We could be together until we got married. And um, we had like that kind of idyllic first year of marriage, which a lot of people don't get. And we were very happy together. Now, that being said, about six months into our marriage, I found a whole bunch of gay porn on our computer. Like I got onto the computer to do something and all of this gay porn just starts popping up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my husband's gay. Like uh, straight guys don't typically look at gay porn. 
And I asked him about it. He's like, oh, no, no, I'm not gay. And he was in extreme denial at that point. Mm -hmm. And then about a year later, he was in counseling. And the counselor's like, yeah, these things are an issue that you're talking about. But the real issue is you're gay. Like you're, you're gay. And so at that point, Steve kind of came to terms with the fact he was gay. Um, and we decided to stay married because we were happy. And we, we both were raised in a very um, conservative Christian religion where LDS, Mormon, however you want to look at it, <laughs> whatever term, you know, and so we stayed married. And um, even during this time, like we were trying to have a daughter. I, I don't get pregnant easily. Um, I am not fertile. And so we were going through like fertility treatments and all that jazz. Um, but we were happy. And it honestly gave Steve a safe place to kind of figure out who he was. Mm. And I was felt very much at peace with that. I knew there was a good possibility we could get divorced, right? Like this is a very real side of him that he might want to experience someday and, and understand on a deeper level. Um, but we stayed married. We had our daughter Penny about five years into our marriage. And then about just before she turned two, um, a few months before that, Steve ended up having an affair. And I remember very clearly I had been out of town for the weekend. I came home. He was at the airport to pick Penny and I up. And it was like, I knew as soon as I saw him, there was something different in, in his appearance. It was so bizarre. And he didn't tell me for a little bit. Like I asked him, I was like, is something going on? What's happened? And then just like a week later, he came clean within a week. He's like, listen, I had an affair. I was with a man and now I don't know what to do. I feel so confused. Mm -hmm. Um, and we tried to work it out for a good a couple months and it was just a mess, like so hard and so, so painful for both of us. Um, we got divorced shortly thereafter. And then <laughs> we actually dated again after we got divorced. He had moved in with this, this guy he had the affair with pretty quick after. And he's like, I'm just not happy. I can't leave you. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so we tried again and it was like six months of hell. <laughs> and but we knew we had tried everything. We had done the best we could and we needed to figure out how our relationship was going to work now. And my biggest fear with getting a divorce was how does this look for my daughter? Like, I know I'm going to be okay, but the only versions of divorce I've seen, my parents are divorced, but like friends and family and people in the church that I had seen get divorced were very negative. And I just thought, I do not want that for my daughter. And so what do I need to do to give her something different. I wanted to be able to be at weddings and graduation and whatever it is she does in life together without her worrying about her parents being in the same room. And Steve and I talked about that a lot. And he was very much, he was very humble. I think we both, I would say we're very humble in that he, he took ownership of his part of it. And he was just appreciative that I was willing to make things work and accept this new reality that was not something we had either of us had planned on. So, yeah. So that's, that was my first marriage. Um, yeah. I just want to go back. I just like, only because this is really in my consciousness right now. This is like something yeah. that's been, that's been coming up a lot is the word affair and the, the connotations of like infidelity and, and what that means and the, the shame that our society has about that and the blame that they want to prescribe to somebody. And it's, uh, it's interesting to me that the, you knew that his sexuality was not straight, right? Yeah. I, I have no doubt in my mind that you guys were like fantastic at being partners, right? We can yeah. be great partners in, mm -hmm. in lots of ways, but it's interesting still that the way that Steve being true to his sexuality is still essentially stigmatized as being an affair, right? And yeah. so it was at least from how I see it and how I understand it, it, it was, it was maybe this really confusing time of like, how do I process this? Like I knew that his, I knew that he was gay. I knew that this was going to happen. Right. But mm -hmm. this is still from what I was led to believe about the world, grew up in the church. This is still an affair. This yeah. is a betrayal. This is all of this. Um, and when you add all of that confusion onto 
maybe his first experience with a man, maybe, yeah. maybe all of this. I, I couldn't imagine what that would have been like to process and go through together and go through a part and all of the feelings that came yeah. a- along with that. And it was very interesting because, I mean, Steve and I, we were very close because we had let each other into our worlds, right? Like he had let me fully into his wor- world and who he was because he had shared this side of me that he had not shared with anybody, mm-hmm. that he was scared to share with anybody because he wasn't sure if people were going to love him afterwards or if how they were going to react. And um, I was the first person he let in that still loved him, right? Mm-hmm. And that that proved to him that he was still worthy and that he was still a good man. And that's what I always told him. I'm like, Steve, this doesn't change who you are. It just is another part of you that we get to, you know, explore and experience. Um, and and people always ask me, well, it, it didn't hurt as bad, you know, because I'm sure it didn't hurt as bad because he's gay. Like it was a man, not a woman. And I'm like, it still hurts. Um, but because I had kind of understood that this was a possibility, I also knew that this wasn't about me. Yeah. There was a huge part of me that really understood and accepted that and made it easier for him to not carry as much shame. He still put a ton of shame on himself, but I did not. I tried my hardest to not add that onto him because I knew he was going through a lot. It was a big change for him. It was a big change for me. And I wanted him to be happy. And I watched, you know, I mean, he, he got to a point where he was suicidal during, during all this because he's coming out and he's so scared and, you know, his family's not sure what to think and all of these things. And I'm like, if he doesn't still have me and understand that I will support him and love him as Penny's dad, as my friend, then who does he have at this point? Like he needs to know that he has me. And so there was a part of me that was able to let go of a lot of things just because I knew how much he was hurting. Um, while that didn't diminish how much I was hurting, I was still allowed to feel that. I still embraced that. And he was very sensitive to that as well. Um, it was like we were given this little gift of a bubble <laughs> to be able to see and understand each other and to and to feel that and to let that be. So it was an interesting and I think very unique process we went through. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I think that, you know, for various reasons, every single day, people end up getting divorced Mm -hmm. and, and I, I've never personally experienced a divorce, but I mean, I work in it every single day. Yeah. I wonder how much of that pain it was related to when you get married, you create a like vision of how the rest of your life is going to go. And, and when that comes to an end, it's like you lose your identity, you lose, I'm no longer Steve's wife, right? We no longer have this life that we have planned together or that I've planned in my mind. And so regardless of the reasons that lead up to the dissolution of a coupling, there's so much stuff the process and there's so many feelings to go through and and what a gift that you are able now to share with the world to come at this from a place of really being in a very unique very painful situation that's not diminished like when people say well like he was gay right like that shouldn't yeah. it, it shouldn't hurt right yeah it's not necessarily about that no and I always tell people I'm like listen you you are allotted that time to mourn what you thought you would have. Just as like you're saying, like you are rethinking your whole life, no matter why you got divorced. There's still this process of mourning what you thought you were going to live, the life you thought you were going to have. Because you don't marry somebody thinking, I'm going to be married to him for five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever, and then we're going to be done. Um, And so there's that part of it. And then I also tell people, But listen, you also have to let go of the idea of what you thought you would have to be able to see what you're being given. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's really something that I was able to do and that Steve was able to do to realize we still had something that could work Mm -hmm. in a different way than we ever imagined. 
but maybe there was something good here. And the more we opened ourselves up to this idea that we could still be friends and get along and do Penny's birthdays together and all of these things, the more beautiful and easier it got. Um, Cause we still got to enjoy good parts of each other. So. And, and the, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, but I wonder if those are like the parts of each other that brought you together as a couple in the first place. Right. Yeah. Like there were, you didn't really change as people from what I understand, other than maybe going through a lot more therapy <laughs> <laughs> yes. toward the end. But, but how amazing is it when we're able to separate the hurt from the person, right? And when we're able to remove ourselves and heal and process and like what an absolute gift for, for everybody, including your daughter and, and your new husband, current husband. Yes. Yes. And that really, it was interesting when Steve and I were talking about our divorce and how we wanted to look. And Steve's like, well, what about your new husband? And I'm like, well, I'm going to need to marry somebody who can at least somewhat embrace our situation, right? Like, yes, things will change and there'll be new boundaries and all of that. Like that's part of new relationships. But I, my goal in dating was to find somebody that was confident, secure enough, and understanding enough to see the benefits of me still having a good relationship with my ex. And Matt very much did. And the awesome thing too was Steve and Matt had a mutual friend and they ended up going mountain biking together like a handful of times before Matt and I met. So they knew each other. And so, and Steve actually introduced me to Matt when they were leaving to go mountain biking one day, they met in the parking lot at this apartment complex where I lived, um, cause the mutual friend lived there and he's like, Hey, this is Matt Fru. Um, he's my biking buddy, whatever. And it was like, I knew I was going to marry this guy, which I always tell people they're nuts when they say that. But, and I told Steve that like a week later, I said, well, I'm going to marry Matt Fru. And he's like, you've only met him that once. I'm like, I know. <laughs> But, and it was, you know, nine months later before we started dating and we actually ended up married. But I think that helped too. That was nice that they already knew each other. But then Matt, that was something that I fell in love with about Matt. We had a lot of other crap to deal with and a lot of other things that made our relationship hard. But that thing of him being okay with my relationship with my ex-husband and being open to getting uncomfortable sometimes to see how it felt and all those things is really, I mean, that for me was like, I'm yours. Like, this is amazing. And, uh, and so I was very grateful that I've been able to marry somebody who was open to that. And, and the thing is, I always say, if we didn't have this side of co-parenting, cause we have two sides of co-parenting where we have an easy relationship with Steve and it works and not that there's not hard times, but in general, it's easy and we have the extreme opposite on Matt's side. And so I'm like, if we did not have one easy side, I don't think we would still be married. Like we could not have emotionally gotten through it, even though we love each other so much. Um, emotionally, I think it just would have done us in. So and Matt, I think that's also why Matt is so understanding because he sees and appreciates this side of things. Right. I wanna ask you, you know, before I, before we press record, we were kind of chatting about this. And from my experience, from what I've observed, um, and if, again, this is just my own lens, how I observe the world, but there tends to be kind of two camps of, of stepmoms that I deal with. And one of those camps is they have a hard time bonding with the kids. And the other camp is that they have a really, really, really high conflict co-parenting relationship. Mm-hmm. And it tends to be that the people who are um, falling into the step queen circles typically tend to have a hard time bonding with the kids, right? We have really intense dynamics with the kids and that's amazing. And I will hold all of the space for that in the whole entire world, but I don't have a whole lot of experience with high conflict co-parenting because I am so removed from the co-parenting relationship. Like my husband and his ex-wife's co-parenting relationship belongs to them. I have nothing to do with it. I have worked through all of my jealousies and my insecurities and stuff that used to get me muddled up into the middle of it. So I don't often engage in conversations 
about this high conflict yeah. dynamic. And I know that it happens and I don't ever for a second want to pretend that it doesn't or that all you have to do is ignore it or, you know, like that silly advice, like, oh, be the bigger person. Da, 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 da. Like that's not yeah. that. I know that it's so much deeper than that. Um, I've just never had to survive that. I've never had to grow through that. I've had to grow through my own stuff, but I haven't gr- had to grow through somebody else's stuff per se. So I don't want to make this like dramatic, but I'm also intrigued to hear because you have such a wise and healed and beautiful perspective. I want to hear what it's like co-parenting with somebody who is almost impossible to co-parent with yeah, and what yeah. that's like for you and how you handle it in a way that doesn't eat you up from the inside. Because it will, it will eat you up from the inside. Um, And that's how it was in the beginning of our marriage, because not only like Matt, when we got married, he was struggling because it was like trauma. Like it brought up a trauma of, oh my gosh, I'm married again. What the heck was I thinking? Because of the things that happened in his first marriage and thought he dealt with it and processed it, but he hadn't. So he was dealing with that. And I'm trying to figure out what the heck just happened to the man I married. Um, and then I'm I'm trying to show up in all the ways, right? I'm trying to be the good stepmom. I'm trying to be the wife to be supportive and take care of the kids and do all these things, which I love doing. Um, and I'm trying to have a good relationship with his ex-wife because I knew what it was like to have a good relationship with my ex. And I so wanted that to be able to have this amazing relationship with his ex-wife um, for him for the kids, for me, for all of us. And I dove in, like we, I would call her when I was taking the kids to the pool and she would meet us there. Um, I'd let her know when I was going to work out because we worked out the same gym, we'd work out together. I took her out for her birthday, for Mother's Day. Like when I tried to connect in real genuine ways that that helped both of us, right? And um, it got to the point where something didn't go right And I didn't think it was a big deal. And the next thing I know, she has like snapped and is yelling at Matt, calling me a bitch in front of the kids. I'm not there. This is all just to Matt. Um, And taking all of these things that were very personal to me and throwing them out there to try and put a wedge in between my husband and I. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what just happened? And And, you know, it's that mourning process again, is I realized, okay, this is not going to be what I thought it was. Um, And while that's okay, we can figure this out. I I need some time to mourn this relationship that I thought I was going to be able to have with his ex and the relationship I thought I was going to be able to have with his kids, because, because of this, because of how she's treating me, how she talks about me, I can't, I can't have the same relationship with the kids. Um, they feed on that. She feeds on that. And so there had to be a lot of boundaries that got put up then of figuring out how to protect all of us. And I'm not saying like boundaries are to keep her out. I think often when we hear boundaries, we're like, this is to just force somebody away. We're trying to whatever, but it's, it's really setting up expectations for how everybody can engage. Okay. Well, these are my boundaries. So we're going to stick with this. Um, so people know what to expect. And ultimately the kids know what to expect. They know how things are going to go down. They know, um, well, mom and my my mom and dad aren't going to engage together. They're going to, this is how pickup and drop-offs are going to go. Um, Jessica's not doing this, this, and this anymore because we've seen how that goes when she does. Um, and it's things like making them lunches for school and stuff like that that I can't do. And while it looks like I'm just a jerk, it's because she's showing up at the school to check their lunches if I make them every day to see what I'm putting in them. And I'm like, this isn't healthy for them. This isn't healthy for me. So I did a lot of work and it took a lot of time for me to remember that, you know, I can keep putting myself out here. I can keep putting myself in this situation. I can keep trying to prove my worth to these people, but all I am doing is telling myself I'm not of worth. And ultimately that's what it came down to is I am losing who I am and I can't do that because that doesn't serve anybody. Um, And that 
something I knew from being married to Steve. Like if I'm going to stay in a marriage to a gay man <laughs> and help and support him, I also have to keep who I am to be able to do that. So I've put in a lot of time of figuring that out and changing ultimately the story I tell myself about who I am and how I am a stepmother. Um, Shameless plug for the stepmom story. Change your story, change your life. <laughs> yes. Change your 100%. story. Change your life. And it's so true. Like it's so cliche, but it's so true. And that's what the stepmom story is all about. Change your story, yes. change your life. Yep. Because nothing, I would argue, nothing about anything really changed as far as the high conflict went. The no. only thing that changed was your story about the high conflict. Am I yeah. correct in assuming that? A hundred percent because I started telling myself, like I'd been telling myself, well, I need to show up. I need to do all of these things to prove myself. And then when I started changing that story of saying, listen, I don't have to, I don't need to do this. Matt is capable. They have two parents who are capable. And if people outside of our relationship judge me for not doing those things, that's on them, not on me, um, which is another thing I live my life by. If somebody judges me, that's their issue, not mine. Um, and so really I was, I started thinking, okay, if I'm staying in this marriage to this man who I love, I have to do this. And while it might be hard for him to understand in the beginning, well, why are you pulling back? He also saw that as I pulled back, it wasn't really pulling back. It was showing up for myself. Um, things got easier, right? Like, oh, she's not complaining about this thing anymore. My ex-wife isn't because Jessica's removed herself from the situation. Or, oh, she's, you know, she finds other things to complain about. But because we're refusing to engage now, it ends. It stops. And so, like, I'll still... Every like once a year, get a text from her out of the blue because we do not talk. I'm I relate to you and that like there's no contact between us. I see her at games, at sporting events, whatever the kids are doing, um, and I'll say hi, but that's it. But I'll get a text like once a year, and they're usually pretty vicious. And I show them to Matt, and I delete them. I do not carry it. I do not go back and read it over and over. I change that narrative like. This might be how she perceives me, but this is not who I am. I remember I was out for a run one day and we had worked past a lot of things, but I was still convinced that I was just a horrible stepmom, that these things were all my fault, that I like, and not all of it, but I took on a lot of it and I'm sitting there running and I'm like, okay, I know how to deal with this. Like I have to change this story I'm telling myself, like I have to change this. And so I really into that of what's true about this is this true that I'm a bad stepmom what are the signs pointing to the fact I'm a bad stepmom and I'm like sure I've made mistakes but I learn from those I try to do better and I'm like what is proof of the opposite that I'm doing okay that things are good and I'm like I give these kids a safe place to live in they they have food to eat they have clothing they have their own rooms that are done however they want like what do you, uh, we help do that? We want them to feel like they have their space in our house. That's theirs every time they come home and I'm giving them space to enjoy their dad, to go have this free time. And I'm like, okay, I need to change what I'm telling myself because ultimately I might not be a perfect stepmom, and that doesn't matter, but I'm a good stepmom, And that has really made a difference. And every time I feel that old way of thinking coming in, I'm like, nope, nope, shut it down. Let's change how we're thinking about this. What is the truth in this situation? Are there things I can improve? But let's work on those. What will make me feel better about myself? Um, and let some of the things go of what I feel I should be doing, that I should mindset, right? Of, well, I should be doing this. Yeah, but it doesn't work for us. So it's okay that I'm not. Yeah. And I and thank you for sharing that. That was like super amazing, super insightful. So thrilled that you just said all of those things. I listener, I'm going to invite you to rewind the last like three minutes and listen to that <laughs> over and over because Jessica just gave you the keys to life. Mm -hmm. Like actually everything you need to know about life is in the last three minutes of this episode and you are welcome. Um, but specifically the, the place that I want to go with this is, um, you know, it's, it's 
it's funny, but not funny because there's no such thing as coincidences, but um, kind of the the theme that's been coming up in the stepmom story right now, if you're not familiar with the stepmom story, it's a, uh, the group community coaching program that I facilitate. And the theme that's been coming up this last week has been in um, self-worth and self-love and these prescriptions that we assign to ourselves of what makes us good, bad, right, wrong, valuable, not valuable, worthy, not worthy. And I would warrant a guess that probably 99% of those really unhelpful, really hurtful things that we tell ourselves all begin with this conversation that we have in our minds of I should da 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 da. So let's go down that rabbit hole, shall we, Jessica? Let's go down the should. Let's go down the shooting on all all over ourselves rabbit hole. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that is, I I 100% agree with you that that is where this starts. That is where it develops. And we, we put on ourselves all of these things we should be doing instead of embracing the things we are genuinely good at. And focusing on the things where we excel and realizing that, you know, this other person is awesome at this other thing. That is so great. I'm so glad they're good at it because I'm not. Instead, we feel like, well, I should be better at this. Um, I just had an example that popped into my head. I have a cousin. She has six babies, like little guys. I swear they're um, they're probably 10 and underwear, under underwear, <laughs> 10 and under. Um, but there's six of them. And her last one she just had, and she's had to, they've had to be in the NICU and like, she's had a hard time with all of them. And I sent her a gift after this last baby. And she, she got on the phone with me and she's like, oh, you're just so thoughtful. I should be better about this. I should be more thoughtful of other people. And then I'm like, hold it right there. You have six kids at home that you are mothering. Like that's enough. You don't need to do anything more. Like this is where I'm at in my life. I have space to do this. I have mental capacity to do this. If you had asked me two years ago, I wouldn't. I didn't have the emotional space to be able to show up like this, but I do now. And I also have the financial space to do this right now. A couple of years ago, I might not have been able to either. And so we don't give ourselves grace in that. We just pile that on to the things that Instead of recognizing, oh, it's so wonderful this person can do this right now, we flip it to, oh, I should be better about doing this thing. I also use like the example, I am not a mom that goes to the school. Like I don't help in classrooms. I don't, um, I don't love going on field trips. I will, but that's not my strength. It's not where I find joy. I like that my daughter goes to school and she gets to learn there and be herself and figure herself out, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to feel bad about that. And I know there's so many moms that feel so guilty because they can't show up in the classroom. If that is your thing, embrace it, go do it. Like, but if it's not let it go. And so we have convinced ourselves that we should be all of these things, our culture, our family, um, our society, like whatever it is, that's influenced you, you hold on to these beliefs And when we start letting go of those beliefs and embracing the things that truly bring us joy, that is when the magic happens. That is when we get to, I I call it being bold. That's when we get to be bold and embrace who we are. And um, I always say, you know, it's not, it's not about being a better version of you. It's not about being the best version of you. It's about being you because then that's when you're all of those things. But we have such a hard time hearing our own self speak hearing what it is we really want because we're so caught up in the I shoulds. Insert mic drop. <laughs> Where's the mic drop? That was, <laughs> I'm, I'm clapping. That was amazing. I've, I have nothing left to say. All right. Well, I can die now because I've heard everything <laughs> here in my life. Okay. Bye. It's been nice. Knowing um, You are truly inspiring and a ray of light and spreading such important healing and hope and transformation across this world. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you because this is not 
this is not an easy place to get to to have this perspective. I'm getting misty right now. It's not an easy place to get to to have this perspective. It's not an easy place to get to to have this level of self-love and self-worth because in my experience, this level of self-love and self-worth usually is only built up when you have been completely 100% broken down into a pile of nothing. And what an absolute gift that you are able to alchemize that pain to bring, to heal other people, to bring them out of this place where they feel like these are the darkest days ever. And man, you're just, you're incredible. You're amazing. And you're, the work that you're doing is so important and so needed. And the message you're sharing is so important and so needed. And I'm very grateful. I'm very, very, very grateful to be um, sharing this with whoever you are listening right now. So thank you. Um, well, thank you. I feel like that's, that's the work we're doing right is to take, it gives, it gives that pain more purpose. It gives where we are at more purpose to be able to help somebody who we know is going through something similar. And if we can help them not get to that low, low, if we can help them see that there's hope and brightness and, and love themselves enough to put, do the work before they hit that point, what a gift and what a blessing to, to be able to share that. And it's not about pretending that there's no pain right? It's about pretending that these things are not wrong. It's about allowing and choosing, but allowing and choosing. Um, Amazing. I don't even know it. I don't even, I don't, how do you follow that? Like anybody have an idea? Anybody have an idea? Anybody have an idea? I don't, I don't. (laughs) Whenever I, well, and I feel like there's some podcast interviews you really connect with. And when I connect Like, I feel like we connected, (laughs) which I love. I love those moments. And that's why I do this. Um, But I feel like those things that we feel like the appreciation that we feel for other people who are doing this work to help other people. That is what I want these women to feel that are listening to this. I want you, the listener, to understand that you are just as strong. You are just as powerful, like even in your pain, even in wherever you're at in this journey, you are still of worth. And to understand that and to see that and to see that, yes, this is work, but man, it is so worth the work and you are worth that work. You are needed. Your voice is needed. What you are doing is enough. Um, and you get to add on to that as you, as you deal with this emotion stuff, as you deal with the emotions and the physical and all of it. I feel like this is the first year I've been able to dive into the real, I mean, I've always taken care of myself. I always work out. Like I love that part of it. It's very therapeutic for me, but this is the first year I've been able to like let my body relax. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's probably been 15 years of my body holding so much of my emotions for me. And I feel like, you know, that's, that's the next phase for me. And we each get to go along these phases and whatever phase you're at is okay. It's beautiful. It's real. Um, and you embrace that and know that you are worthy at that, at that state. So, so good. So good. I wanted to, um, before we wrap up here, you shared a really beautiful thing with me on Instagram today. (laughs) Can you talk about that for a second? Because how cool is that? So we, for years, have always joked about the fact that there are not, there's not a Hallmark section or not a greeting card section in Hallmark that speaks to exes, co-parents, um, any of that, and or to stepmoms or stepdads. And I was like, you know what, this Mother's Day, let's put together a line of greeting cards that goes to this issue. And there are some that are super, I mean sarcastic and whatever. And then there are some that are very tender and loving. Um, 
and so, yeah, we put that out there just today in time for Mother's Day and Father's Day, but there's cards for all across the board. You could use them for any time of year. Um, but really just speaking to this, I mean, there's so many of us out there, right? Like this is. There's so many of us out there. There's yeah. so many of us out there. Yeah. It's just the story. And so I'm like, if we can speak to the some and, and honestly, it's like we talk about with all marginalized groups, right? That, and I'm not saying I'm a marginalized group, but being a stepmom, you can feel that way. Like you can feel this, a similar aspect of that. Um, but you don't see that. It's not normal enough it, to be in the greeting card store yet. You know, it's not accepted enough. It's not understood to be there. And so I'm like, we can speak to this. We can sit down and, and there's some pretty, there's some pretty funny ones on there. And some, like I said, some that are very thoughtful, but they go uh, across the board. Greeting cards for stepmoms. That mom listening, you can send this to your spouse and they can get you a card. Um, but you know what we're going to do for you, listener? We're going to link those greeting cards up for you for free in the show notes. So if you want to go ahead and take a peek and pretend send a really sassy greeting card to your <laughs> spouse's ex, there's a there's a button for that. There's an option for that. I am releasing myself from any liability of anything that might come from that. So I do not recommend just do it in your head. Just do yeah, it don't send head. the card. Don't, don't send, send the card. it. But some just are, write it out. <laughs> some are nice though. They are so nice. Ones. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I do have a free workbook that goes back to that change your story, change your life thing too, that you can pick up online as well. Um, just to start, start that process of changing your mindset. Amazing. And it sounds like you speak to that in your, in the things you do as well. So that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Jessica, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, follow along with you and your super cool, cool journey, listen to your husband-in-law podcast, how can they find you? Where's the best place to find you? Where do you hang out the most? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram the most under husband-in-law. Um, you can find us there. And then also our podcast, you know, we're showing up every week. We're a hundred episodes in as of this, as of today. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah, husband-in-law on any podcasting platform, husband-in-law on Instagram. I do have a Facebook group called the Bold Action Takers. I'm there as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for this interview. I was amazing. You helped a lot of people with the message that you shared and you are going to continue to help a lot of people and we love you and we appreciate you so Thank you so much, Jessica. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. I hope this episode got your wheels turning and showed you just how powerful you are. I would invite you to take 30 seconds and tap subscribe to this podcast. When you subscribe to the podcast, then rest assured you will never miss an episode. And in no time, spinning your wheels will be a thing of the past. Thank you for listening and subscribing. And if you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the absolute world to me if after you subscribed, you jumped on over and left me a five-star review and better yet, a written review. I am on a mission to let every mom and stepmom know that you can create the life of your dreams. And I need your help to change the world. The world needs us. Thank you so much for subscribing and leaving me a five-star review. I will see you next week, same time, same place. For more behind-the-scenes action and to get really up close and personal with me and our beautiful step family, jump on over to Instagram and follow me at the step Queen. Don't be shy. Send me a DM. Tag me in your posts. Tag me in your stories. Let me know what you're up to and what about the podcast has been blowing your mind. I cannot wait to get to know you better. And Instagram is my jam. I love you so much. I love you so much. Make it rain, girlfriend. <laughs>